Earlier this week, we explained that populations can grow at geometric or exponential rates in the presence of abundant resources. But as resources are depleted, population growth slows and eventually stops, as seen in models of logistic population growth. While food may seem like an obvious example of a resource that individuals may compete for, more generally, a resource can be considered any feature of an environment that is required for growth, survival, or reproduction, and can be used to the point of depletion. Recall this figure from our previous lecture that illustrated the growth of a barnacle population. The population began to level off after about two weeks, but food was not the limiting resource. Space was. Eventually, there wasn't any more space available on the rock for the larvae to attach themselves. This reduction in growth was the result of what we call intraspecific competition, because it is competition occurring between individuals of the same species. This type of competition can cause density-dependent reductions in population size, such as those we explored in the last lecture. Now we are going to consider the effects on population size when individuals of different species are competing for the same resources. Which brings us to our first key concept. Interspecific competition occurs between individuals of different species that share the use of a resource that limits their growth, survival, or reproduction. Just as before, this resource does not have to be food or water. We might have competition for space when that is in short supply, as it is for these hard coral species. Or we might even consider competition for light among plants in the forest undergrowth. Any resource that can be consumed or depleted can provide a source of competition. So I'd like to take a moment to introduce you to Robert MacArthur, who even in his short life was a highly influential architect of modern ecology by helping to merge the roles of naturalists with those of theoretical biologists. In 1955, MacArthur was a graduate student at Yale University, studying the ecology of five warbler species that lived together in the spruce forests of the northeastern U.S. The Cape May Warbler, the Blackburnian, Black-throated Green, the Bay-breasted, and the Yellow-rumped Warbler. Now, MacArthur noted that while density-dependent events play a major role in regulating population size, interspecific relationships were also important because the presence of an individual of another species may actually have some of the same effects as an individual of the same species. Now, it was already accepted that two species using a limited resource in the same way cannot coexist indefinitely, and this is a concept that we refer to as the competitive exclusion principle. MacArthur questioned why competition wasn't excluding some of these species. All of these species were about the same size and shape, and they all feed on insects, and to MacArthur it was puzzling that they could all live together in such an apparently simple habitat. Thus he hypothesized that two, or five in some cases, species with identical ecological requirements would compete with each other and could not live in the same environment indefinitely. And he decided to explore whether this hypothesis held true for these warbler species by categorizing their foraging behavior. MacArthur would take a tree and subdivide it into 16 zones based on height off of the ground and distance from the trunk. Height zones were measured in 10-foot units from the top of the tree, and each branch was divided into zones that were the interior bare branches of the tree, middle zones of old needles, or the terminal parts of the branch that contained the new needles. He would then record the number of seconds that an individual spent in a particular portion of the tree. This figure illustrates the data from one of those species, the black-throated green warbler. Let's consider for now just the left side of this figure, which represents percentage of time an individual spent in each of these zones. The most concentrated activity was shaded until at least 50% of the activity was marked. So you can see here that this species spent the majority of its time 40 to 50 meters above the ground, foraging primarily on branches with new needles. These data are simplified in this illustration, where the peach color represents regions where the birds were found. He repeated the same analysis for all five species and obtained the following results. As you can see, all of these species focus their foraging in different zones, extracting food from different parts of the forest, if you will. MacArthur concluded that this resource partitioning reduced competition between the species and allowed them to coexist in the same location. Which leads us to our second key concept. Complete competitors cannot coexist. Competitors may coexist when they use resources differently. Now, evidence for resource partitioning has been found in many other species, including protists, lizards, fish, crustaceans, and plants. An overall study suggests that a species can coexist if they use resources in different ways, an inference that is also supported by results from mathematical modeling. So how can we model these types of interactions? 
Let's begin by revisiting our equation for logistic population growth and assume that in the absence of competition, a species grows according to this equation. Then, to model the effect of a competitor species, the logistic equation can be altered in a way that mimics the effects of competition. Now, in the late 1920s, two researchers, Alfred Latka and Vito Volterra, independently derived a way to use the logistic equation to model interspecific competition. Vito Volterra was actually an Italian mathematician and physicist. In 1931, he was one of a small minority of Italian professors who refused to sign an oath of allegiance to Mussolini and was thus forced to resign his university position and go abroad. He was stripped of all his privileges and honors in Italian universities, but later returned to Rome just before his death in 1940. Alfred Latka, on the other hand, was not a scientist in the usual sense and wasn't associated with any university or scientific institution. He was actually a supervisor of the statistical office of the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company of New York, so he did have a very strong grasp of population statistics. So let's begin by considering two separate equations to describe the logistic growth of two hypothetical species. And throughout this presentation, I'll be representing species one by blue and species two always by green. Now the variables in these equations haven't changed. K is still the carrying capacity, R is still the intrinsic rate of increase, and N is still the current population size. However, this format now acknowledges that the values may be different between the two species, hence the one and the two. So in other words, this K sub one is the carrying capacity of species one, which may be different than the carrying capacity of species two. In order to account for the effects of competition, we are going to add one additional variable to each of these equations, and we refer to this variable as the competition coefficient. For species one, this coefficient is represented by alpha, which is the effect an individual of species two has on the population growth of species one. Now note in this equation that we are multiplying alpha by n2, or this population size of species two. This makes sense because you're considering the effect that one individual of species two has, alpha, and multiplying it by the number of individuals in species two, n2, and the product will then be the cumulative effect of the entire species two population on species one. So we can do the exact same thing to the species two equation, but we will use the coefficient beta and then multiply that by n1. Now if this seems a little confusing or a little abstract, I completely understand. So let me just present a quick example that might help put things into perspective. So let's imagine that we want to model the competition between a population of gray squirrels, which will designate a species one, and chipmunks that will designate species two. So here's our equation for species one that we were using before. And recall that alpha is the competitive effect that a single chipmunk from species two has on the squirrel population. So this measures basically the intraspecific competition relative to the intraspecific competition. So in other words, how many individuals of species two or chipmunks are equivalent to one squirrel in terms of their use of the resource. So in terms of this common resource use, one chipmunk might be hypothetically the equivalent of a quarter of a squirrel. So it would take four chipmunks competing with a squirrel to equal the competition from another squirrel. Thus, the coefficient would be 0.25. We can then take that alpha coefficient and multiply it by the number of chipmunks to get the overall effect of in squirrel equivalents that the chipmunks have on the squirrels. These equations can provide us with a very powerful tool to predict the outcome of competition. So if we know how each species population is changing and the competitive effect they have on each other, we can then determine whether one species is going to win the competition and drive the other to extinction, or if they will both be able to coexist. So we'll begin by determining when the population of each of these species would stop changing. As we saw in the logistic growth model, dn over dt represents the rate of change in population size at each instant in time. When dn over dt equals zero, the population size stops changing and remains constant unless perturbed in some way. So for example, if many individuals died in a catastrophic fire or a storm. Now right now, this equation is just a simple product of three values. And as I'm sure you remember from basic math, substituting zero for any one of these would make this statement true. Now we have two options. The first, setting n1 equal to zero simply states the obvious. A population with no members does not grow. 
The second option would be to calculate what would make this red highlighted part of the equation equal to zero. Now obviously we can't have a carrying capacity equal to zero or this fraction would be undefined, so we have to set the numerator equal to zero and solve for n1. This gives us what we refer to as the zero population growth isocline for species one. When the species one population is equal to its carrying capacity minus the product of the competitive effect of species two, it will be stable in population and not change. Now logically this also makes sense. When we were just considering the logistic growth model, the stable population size was the carrying capacity. Now that we have competitors to worry about, the stable population size is being reduced. We can do the exact same calculation for species 2. To check your understanding, pause this video and go back to calculate the zero growth isocline for species 2. Resume the video when your calculation is complete. Hopefully you were able to derive an isocline of K2 minus beta times N1. So recall from the last lecture that under the logistic growth model alone, if individuals were only competing with members of the same species, the population would be stable if it was equal to the carrying capacity. So in this case, N1 would equal K1, or N2 would equal K2. Now when interspecific competitors are in the picture, the population needs to be less than the carrying capacity in order to be stable. The environment can't sustain a population as large as the carrying capacity due to the presence of an interspecific competitor. I find it helpful to think of this as a modified or a realized carrying capacity. If we increase N2, so we're adding more species to or adding more competitors, the stable population of N1 will decrease and vice versa. Now you might have noticed that both of these are simply equations for lines. Alpha and beta are constants, as are the carrying capacities, but we can think of N1 and N2 as values on an xy axis in order to plot these lines. So let's begin by just considering the isocline for species 1. Note that this line intersects the horizontal axis when n2 equals 0, or the population size of species 2 is 0. We can plug 0 in for n2 in our equation, and then solve for n1 to get that intercept. And as you can see, that value is k1, or the carrying capacity of species 1. This probably isn't surprising to you. If there were no individuals of species 2, there would be no competition, and species 1 would be able to reach its carrying capacity and stabilize at that level. What about the other intercept? Why don't you pause this video and see if you can solve this on your own. I'm sure that wasn't too much trouble. Hopefully you plugged in zero for the N1 population size and proceeded to solve for N2, arriving at K1 over alpha. We can complete the exact same analysis with the species 2 isocline, only now the species of concern is on the vertical axis. Try to solve for these intercepts on your own, and resume the video when you've completed this. Hopefully you were able to determine that when n1 equals 0, the isocline intercepts the n2 axis at a value of k2, or the carrying capacity of species 2. When n2 equals 0, the isocline intersects the n1 axis at k2 over beta. To keep things simple, for now we are just going to consider a single isocline, and I'm going to remove the intercept labels. Here is the line represented by the species 1 isocline as a function of the population sizes of species 1 and the population sizes of species 2. The population of species 1 will be stable and unchanging at any combination of N1 and N2 that falls on this line. So hypothetically, if species 1 has this many individuals, the population size will be stable and unchanging if species 2 has this many individuals. Or in other words, while the population might otherwise be undergoing logistic growth in the absence of species 2, the effect of competition from species 2 prevents that growth from occurring and keeps the size of species 1 stable. What if the combination of N1 and N2 don't lie on the line? By definition, because this is an isocline of zero growth, that means that N1 is not stable and will change if this point is not on the line. But will it increase or will it decrease? Let's keep the size of species 1 the same, but let's reduce the size of species 2. 
Now our point would fall below this isocline. We just said that if the point is not on the isocline, the species 1 population will change. Because this point is located below the isocline, the population size of species 1, or N1, is going to increase. This is a generalization that will hold true whenever you are examining a point relative to an isocline. If a species population size is below its own isocline, the population size will increase. Now this makes both logical and mathematical sense. If the number of competitors was reduced below the level required to keep species 1 in check, species 1 will be able to grow in size. So revisit our modified equation for population growth that you saw a few slides ago. Now rec recall that under zero growth conditions, this numerator was equal to zero. If we reduce N2, the numerator of this fraction will go from being zero to a positive number, which will in turn change dn over dt from zero to a positive number. The population size of species one will now get larger. The exact opposite is true if the combination of populations places the point above the isocline. So let's assume that we have an N1 the size of this. In order to fit the zero growth isocline, species 2 would have to have a population size right about here. But what if there were more of species 2 than that? Now we have a point that is above the species 1 isocline. Again, if the point is not on the species 1 zero growth isocline, the species 1 population will change. Because this point is located above the isocline, the population size of species 1, or N1, is going to decrease. This is a generalization that will also hold true. If a species population size is above its own isocline, the population size will decrease. Notice that our increase and decrease arrows are only pointing left and right. This is because right now we are only considering the species 1 isocline and what happens to N1. Because this population is plotted on the horizontal axis, moving to the right is increasing and towards the left decreasing. I think you can probably guess where we are headed next from there. We can complete the exact same analysis with the species 2 isocline, only now the species of concern is on the vertical axis. If the N1, N2 population plot point is below the species 2 isocline, species 2 will increase. If it is above, species 2 will decrease. So in order to make predictions about a population's trajectory, we need to know A, what the current population size is of species 1 and species 2, and B, whether that point is above or below each species isocline. When we plot both isoclines together, they can take one of four orientations. In the first option, the isoclines do not cross, and the species 1 isocline is above the species 2 isocline. In this orientation, species 1 will always win and drive species 2 to extinction. So how does this occur? Let's first consider what happens if the populations of species 1 and 2 were to be plotted somewhere in this zone. Note that we are below both isoclines, so species 1 is going to increase, and species 2 is going to increase. So our next point might be somewhere about here. In this blue shaded region, we are above both isoclines, so species 1 will decrease, species 2 will decrease, and our next point might be here. In this orange region, it is below the species 1 isocline, so species 1 will increase, but it is above the species 2 isocline, species 2 will decrease. This trajectory will continue until species 2 is eliminated, at which point species 1 will be able to stabilize at its carrying capacity. Note that this option does not require the two isoclines to be parallel, only that they just cannot cross. The second option is similar to the first in that the isoclines do not cross, but in this case the species 2 isocline is above species 1. The outcomes in the blue and green regions are the same as before because we are still either above or below both isoclines. However, this time in the middle we are below isocline 2 and above isocline 1, so the exact opposite happens. Species 1 decreases and is eventually driven to extinction as species 2 increases and stabilizes at its carrying capacity. Species 2 wins. I think you're starting to get the hang of this now, so time to get a little tricky. What happens if the isoclines cross? Note that in this option, the carrying capacities are the highest intercept on either axis. Now we have four regions to consider. Using the same method of analysis as options one and two, 
Consider the direction of population change in each of these regions. Pause the video and take a moment to sketch these arrows on a sheet of paper. The blue and green regions are pretty straightforward, as before. However, the overall winner is determined by which of the two orange regions the population trajectories enter first. If it's the dark orange, we are below the species 1 isocline, above the species 2 isocline, so species 1 will win. The exact opposite will happen with the light orange section. In other words, one species will win, which one depends on how their populations change over time. And finally, option four. The isoclines are still crossing, but this time the carrying capacities are the lower intercepts. In this case, the population trajectories will lead both species populations to the intersection of the isoclines. Once here, because we are on both isoclines, neither population will grow any further, and they will stabilize at this equilibrium density. Note, however, that the final density of each is lower than the carrying capacity of either. This is the only scenario in which competitive exclusion does not occur. Time to check your understanding with two different examples. These problems can also be found in a separate file on Blackboard. In the land between the lakes, elk, and bison prairie, we currently have 125 bison and 15 elk. These species are known to compete for some, but not all, of their resources. We are able to determine that the carrying capacity of the bison, K1, is 200, and that the alpha competition coefficient is 4. The carrying capacity for elk, K2, is 100, and the beta competition coefficient is 1. Over time, will both species be able to coexist? If not, which one will be driven to extinction in this area? So how do you approach this type of problem? You saw earlier in this presentation that we can determine the isocline intercepts if we know the carrying capacities and the competition coefficients. Begin by using the given information to plot your isoclines on a graph. The values you calculate for the intercepts will help you determine whether they cross or not and which one is above the other. Now consider your starting population sizes. N1, the bison, is 125, and N2, the elk, is 15. Where does this plot on your graph? In other words, is it in the blue, the green, or one of the orange regions? What will be the outcome of this competition? Question 2. A small lake is capable of supporting both bluegill and smallmouth bass. These two bony fish species compete for similar food resources. The carrying capacity of this lake for bluegill, K1, is 1,500, and for bass, K2, is 500. After some careful measurement, we find that alpha is 0.5 and beta is 0.25. We stock the lake with 250 bluegill and 750 bass. Over time, will both species be able to coexist? If not, which one will be driven to extinction in this lake? If they are able to coexist, approximately how many of each species will be present? The answers to both of these questions are due in class on Thursday. Please include a sketch of your isocline graphs along with any math to support your conclusions. Thanks for watching and see you all soon.